If not, that's okay. Um, so, we will start. I will share my screen. Um, screen. Just let me make a couple of adjustments because I'm also recording. Yeah, I think that will be fine. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Okay, so a couple of uh, answers from questions that I had before. The first one is, uh, what are we using to actually as, as, a, as a development environment? Uh, for today and probably for tomorrow, we will use Google Colab. That is a platform where that uh, Google open to steal your data, to steal your code. Uh, basically, they open this so you can code and share code. And of course, they will use this data to train uh, their own stuff um, from using this. But it's, it's cool because uh, it's very useful to actually start using machine learning and also share stuff with machine learning. I had a message here. Okay. Um, because of two reasons. One is like the GPU shortage around the world. Today, like companies are struggling hard uh, with the fabrication of um, chips, car manufacturers, computer manufacturers, video card, GPU manufacturers, everybody. So this is why it, this is the worst time to buy a computer. The worst, like by far. Especially if you are um, a gamer, because now with the with the boom of um, cryptocurrency, uh, miners are basically buying all the possible GPUs that you can buy. Um, so yeah, it is impossible. Second reason, um, if you're using Mac, uh, even though like Apple has this core ML uh, framework to do machine learning. Uh, usually you use it with Objective-C or Swift that are different programming languages not I mean if you're an app developer probably you're familiarized with that and you can use those like in a really easy way but that's not the purpose I mean you want to start doing machine learning hopefully with Python because you will find more information and debugging stuff on internet a stack overflow for example and so if you have a Mac it's good to use Google Colab because basically everything is in the cloud. And the third reason, I will explain it now. So when you open uh, Google Colab, you will see something like this. It will show you your last stuff. You will see some examples. You will see a, something that uh, points you to your Google Drive account or a GitHub. Uh, or you can upload something that is called an, an IPYB file. That is a Python notebook. That basically is a format of coding that is uh, it's quite interesting because you can code pieces of code and execute pieces of code independently. Um, so it's like it's good for 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 uh, teaching purposes and also to understand in a more uh, let's say uh, organized way what you're coding. That is another reason. So. If you're here, colab.research.google.com, you want to press here a new notebook, where it says like new notebook here. And this will take you, I will close a couple of things here because I don't need this, 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 this. I will point you to more resources uh, in a future email. So what you will see here is this. This is the Google Colab environment. You will find something that is like some sort of cell where you can basically write whatever you want. Uh, this is a cell to write code. This is called a cell, right? And you can delete the cell, like uh, mirror the cell to code to different things. You can do like a lot of things that I will explain later. Probably your collab, right, looks white. It's not that I'm using like a, some sort of like hipster dark mode. 
I'm just using, uh, if you see here, I'm using Colab Pro. Colab Pro, I mean, Google Colab is free, but you can pay $9.99 per month to get some exclusive features. So, for example, like more GPU time for training or things like that. Um, in this case, for this workshop, it doesn't matter if you have Google, uh, uh, you have Colab, the, the, the the default one. You might if you want to train more data because there are two differences and this is something important that I need to tell you. Uh, with uh, Cola Pro, first you have access to better GPUs. Basically you're connecting to Google and you're using their computers and their GPUs to do your calculations. So you will get access to way better GPUs. Uh, the second thing is that um, you can have your code, up, your code running up to 12 hours in the free version and up to 24 hours in the pro version. So let's say you're training a model that it takes 15 hours, probably your model will stop working at 12 hours. Right? That usually is not a problem because if you train for 12 hours then you can resume the next day and do another 12 hours and things like that. But if you're using Cola Pro, you can just do it in one run and everything is fine and everybody's happy. Um, but Colab, again, it, it has like cool features. So for example, you will see that this uh, table of contents will be like filled with content as, as we go and write stuff. Uh, we can search for certain things. Uh, we have code snippets that we won't use today, but we will use uh, another occasion to, for example, do camera capture, that basically is a snippet that allows you to run JavaScript code inside Python. Um, and here, basically, you have a, a folder with content that you can upload or you can connect to your Google Drive. So in this case, you will see that also um, you have two options here to create code, a code cell or a text, text cell. So what will happen today is that we will uh, go through the code, we will code stuff, but then at the end of the session, when I send you an email with uh, more information, maybe papers or other stuff, I will also send you uh, this Google Colab so you can copy it in your drive with more things. So you can, for example, do more interesting stuff with, you, with your own data. Uh, because tomorrow we will move to something that is related to this, but more scale. We will start using GANs, and I will explain you how to code GANs and how GANs work, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and other cool stuff. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but today we will start with this. Another important thing is here. You see, if you see a word that it says connect, you want to click on that. So this will connect you to a session in Google server, and it will give you a certain amount of disk and a certain amount of RAM, right, memory to run your code. So in this case, when I hover, like I put my mouse over this, it says that I'm connected to a Python 3 Google Compute Engine backend, and I'm having like certain amount of RAM and certain amount of hard drive uh, to use, right? And here you can basically like uh, connect to your own server or manage your sessions and stuff like that. Usually, in the pro version, you can have like efficiently running up to two collabs. I try with like high data, um, but with the pro version, uh, sorry, the free version, one is okay. Otherwise, Google can kick you out and and not train anymore. Uh, one important thing that we need to do now when we start. Uh, this is not necessary for the code today, but for future. Um, the, 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 the other versions, we want to configure our notebook, right? This is called a notebook. Usually Python files are just like, let me show you one if you have never done Python, so we can um, get rid of that immediately. This is Visual Studio Code. We might use it, I don't know uh, uh, if that's the case. So for example, uh, this is just like a Python file, right? All the code is just in one piece of text. 
Oh, sorry, because I'm sharing. Let me, yeah, let me share. Da, 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 da. I need to do a new share. Um, here, right? So what you see here is um, just like default Python code, but basically this is a, a py file uh, that is everything is together. What we're doing is something similar, but in this case, uh, what we are creating is a notebook that combines text at the same time it combines code that you can run independently. So I will switch back to my uh, Google Colab. So again, if you if you put your mouse here at the upper part of the cell, you can add code or text either like above or below the cell. So for example, here I will just click on text. And if you double click here, uh, we can start writing uh, stuff. So for example, in this case, what we will start, what we will do today, we will start with a simple classification tutorial. We will create our first uh, neural network. We'll create our own architecture and we will train an artificial, uh, basically this this model, and that is super useful because uh, if I don't do this and if I just jump to the complex part, probably you will be lost and you don't know what to modify later. At least with this, will give you like some sense of what's going on, and because more or less like a, 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 in a general uh, way, everything works like more or less the same. So let's start with this. We'll say like simple classification. Oops, wait here. Simple classification tutorial, and we'll call this like uh, session session zero one. And if you want to, you see here, you see the text. If you want to make this like a title, you just press that, and we can start writing our code. Usually, actually, I will add. Uh, one more thing to the text here. We will put this as steps. The step one in every, not only Python code, but when you're when you're working with libraries and you're working with with um, functionalities that lie in another, like say like file or on the internet in the cloud or whatever, you need to do your import. Basically, it's like import functionality inside your code so you can use it. Um, so we will do that. Step one, imports, libraries or parameters or so on. One thing that I forgot to mention is again, uh, before we do anything, we can change the name of the, of the, of the file. You see that the extension is IPYNB uh, for IPython notebook. If you change the name, Futures and automatically this will be saved in your Google Drive account. So this is why it's necessary to have a Google account. Uh, the second thing that I forgot to mention is that if you go to edit, you will find something that is called notebook settings. And if you click here, edit notebook settings, uh, you will find a couple of interesting things. First is the hardware accelerator. By default, if you don't configure this, you won't use a GPU to do what you need to do. That means that some stuff will not work by default because you need a GPU to train. Why GPUs? Because GPUs, they work with something that is called parallel computing. And probably you have heard this, that GPUs have, uh, I don't know, when, when you buy, for example, a laptop or a computer, usually it's like the processor is a quad core processor, right? Or your phone is a, octa-core processor. It has like eight, four, two, six cores, and so on and so forth. Now, for example, like desktop computers have like 64, for example, like cores, or servers, they have more. Um, but imagine, like most of computers have like four to eight, right? Uh, and that means that you can parallelize computation. So basically, you can split your computation into eight cores, for example, right? In the case of GPUs, GPUs have thousands of cores, right? For example, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, they are like uh, so good because they have something that are called CUDA cores, 
that basically they deal with those are like tiny like smaller cores compared to a, uh, to a CPU but because you have so many and these are specialized especially spe specifically to compute uh, matrix uh, matrix operations so for example matrix um, multiplications or divisions or, and, and specific mathematical operations uh, they do very well with machine learning so, for example, you can parallelize operations uh, across, I don't know, like GPUs now, they have like 8,000 cores, CUDA cores. So, imagine like splitting all your data across 8,000 cores and doing those multiplications that are specific for image processing, right? This is why also why GPUs are, are, are so good for, for this type of task. So, you can do that faster. If you try to do the same thing instead of splitting your 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 machine learning model in 8,000 cores, you will be doing it in eight cores. So this is why a model that could take two days to train on a GPU, it could take two months or more just using your CPU. So this is why sometimes you just cannot use uh, uh, only CPU to train a model. So here you have a GPU and also you have TPU. These are graphical processor, uh, processing units and these are tensor processing units. This is a other type of things to when you're not dealing with images but other type of data you want to use for a specific reasons TPUs. Uh, Google Colab tells you that unless it's absolutely necessary don't use TPU just use GPU so you want to do this uh, use GPU and also you can uh, start your, your, your notebook with standard data or high RAM data. So today we will leave it in uh, standard because we won't use a lot of uh, uh, RAM. Uh, but if you are using, for example, GANs or models like uh, a one that I will show you in the last session, we need to configure this to high RAM, otherwise our collab will crash. Um, and we don't want that. So GPU and standard, and you press save. This will restart the session because basically it will allocate memory and resources. So I will I will show you tomorrow like how to see what type of GPU you're using that are like um, you can have you, you can get lucky and use for example like a B100 that is like like or a K100 uh, uh, GPUs that are they have different speeds but we don't care about that we care about making first our imports for the code and in Python if you want to make a comment something I, let me put this bigger so you can see it better if you want to comment something or write like a note inside your code, you just use the pound sign. Necessary libraries. Necessary libraries. So in this case, we will start with um, importing a couple of things that are useful. So the first thing we will say like import, right? And we will say like matplotlib. And a good thing about uh, Google, um, sorry, Colab is that it has autocomplete. So if you write like the first part of your of your words, you can see it makes suggestions. So the first suggestions that we that like once um, what we want to write actually is this line. We want to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And if you're not familiarized with with Python, basically this is a library to plot data basically to show for example like a graph uh, to to show the, the progress of your of your training uh, the the most famous library in the world of like coding and machine learning is uh, numpy so we will write import numpy as np why we have this as PLT or as NP is because uh, when we use these libraries inside our code, we don't want to write like matplotlib.pyplot. We would just want to write like PLT and then something. Or we want we don't want to write numpy. We want to write like NP and something. So basically, it's like it's like an alias. Um, this uh, performs complex math operations is for fast like math computing we want to import OS because we want to deal with uh, 
to uh, play with files. And, uh, probably play is not the best word, but basically to do stuff with files, import pictures and things like that. Uh, we want to import PIL. This is a Python image library. Uh, PIL is a library that allows you to work with images, like in an easy way. Uh, we want to also import a framework that we will use probably only today. Have you heard about TensorFlow before? Well, in the world of machine learning, there are like different uh, libraries or frameworks or platforms, that's, that's a better word, to do machine learning. TensorFlow is the platform uh, created and maintained by Google to do machine learning. You will see a lot of things implemented in TensorFlow. I will show you at the end of the class one good uh, thing that I want you to try. Um, and we will do something at the beginning of the class. If not, I will send you a video on how to use what I will show you at the end of the class using TensorFlow. So uh, basically it's a set of commands or it's a library where you can do like an architecture, training, basically create machine learning models. There is another platform or framework that is called PyTorch. And PyTorch is uh, developed by Facebook yeah, and maintained by Facebook. And I prefer PyTorch over TensorFlow uh, because it, it can do things like easy. But sometimes, I mean, it, it depends. It depends on the flavor. Of, of the things that you're doing, you want to pick between that or, or, or PyTorch or TensorFlow. But you also have other stuff like Cafe, for example, or you have um, CoreML, that is the Apple's uh, implementation. Um, there, are, there are many. I mean, uh, there are also like open source initiatives like um, ONNX. Basically, it's like an uh, open neural network exchange file. So you can basically exchange independent of the framework that you use. You can translate your models. Um, you can find a lot of information, and I can point you to, to, to those so you can know more about it. So, so in this case, we will use TensorFlow. So we will say, like, import TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow as TF. Again, we don't uh, this machine ML platform. We don't want to uh, uh, write every time that we want to use TensorFlow, like TensorFlow. That's something. Just TF. That's something. And another important thing that we need to import. We need to import. Uh, no, actually, we want to do something like that, like this from TensorFlow. Right? We are in here we're importing all the functionality of TensorFlow, but from TensorFlow we want to import Keras. What is Keras? Keras is a let me put it here. Keras is a deep, deep learning API. It's simple, flexible, and powerful according to their words. So basically it's like um, a way of using TensorFlow in a human readable way. So basically it simplifies the way that we want to create our models, our architectures. That is what we want to do today. So basically it's like writing less code in a more human readable way. And it works perfectly well with, with uh, TensorFlow. So uh, human readable API for deep or machine learning. Uh, from TensorFlow uh, that Keras, so basically from this import, we want to import layers. So basically, this is this are the function. This is the functionality that allows us to create different layers. Remember what I explained in the presentation, like convolution layers, or max pooling layers, or fully connected layers. We will do it through this. And also, we will say like from TensorFlow uh, that Keras that models 
we will import sequential. And I will explain that in a second. So these are the imports. And um, for example, to if we press play, this button that is play over here, we will run the cell. So basically we will execute this chunk of code. And unless we get an, we have something like poorly written. So for example, let me just delete a, a, a M here. If I um, execute this, this will give me an error because basically there is, there is an invalid syntax because there is nothing that is called eport. So it's import, right? So if I execute this and I don't see this in red or an error here, is that it's because everything was okay, right? So that was step one, our imports, the necessary things that we need to actually create our neural network. But no neural network, or in this case, machine learning model or architecture will work if we don't have our data. So that data will be our following uh, thing. So I will write here the step two, get our data. Perfect. And for this, remember I click here, text, it created its text uh, cell. And now if I go with my mouse to the lower part of this cell, I can create a cell for code. That's, that's super easy. If I want to move a cell, I have arrows here. If I want to move it up or if I want to move it down, you can do it. If you want to delete the cell, you can just uh, go here and press the trash can uh, icon. So we will start with our, uh, uh, with our data. We will do the following thing. We will create one more import. Um, so we will do, basically we will get a data set with flower images. There's nothing creative about this. We will just use like data that is out there on the internet to actually create our thing. Tomorrow we can do with other type of data. I will, actually th there was another workshop uh, in this edition of Digital Futures that is called like the meat of, of AI or something like that, that they teach you how to create data sets. I will teach you that as well. So basically you will have two workshops condensed in one. Because the important thing and what we want to do is to train stuff with our own data. But for but first, we will use data that is already there. So we will use flowers and we will classify flowers. Uh, so in this case, we will do something like this. We will do import uh, pathlib. Pathlib is a library that allows us to create uh, data paths to get our data. And we will do the following thing. I will copy this line in the chat so you can copy it because it's a long address. We will specify our data set uh, URL. And we will write a URL with the data that we want to use. So I will put it here and I will put it in the chat so you can copy and paste it. This data set, if I follow the link, uh, it will Basically, it's, it's a, a from, the, from the Google API from TensorFlow, we will get example images and we will get a library with flower pictures. Basically, it's a data set with flowers that are labeled. We will see that in a minute. So if you do it like this, data set underscore URL equals to this address in quotes, basically because this is a string, uh, we can create our data set. So we will say like data there equals to tf, because we are using TensorFlow, uh, tf.keras.utils.getfile. This is the syntax. With this, we need to provide a, um, we need to pass a couple of parameters. Basically, this is a method or a function. You see, this is a, the, the, the method is get file. Here we will see this. We need to provide a name for our data set, the origin, and a couple of more things. So we will do that now. First, we will call this flower photos. We will 
put coma, this basically flower photo is, is the name that we're doing to our data set, uh, in parameter origin, this will be equal to data set URL. We will pass basically this uh, internet aid address, data set URL, and the other parameters will be on tar, basically tir t. Um, yeah, tar is a, is a is an extension for compressed files. So what we want to do, we want to uncompress that file. You see that tar is this um, extension here. It's similar to rar or zip files. So we want to uh, decompress this. And next, what we want to do, we want to say like our data directory, data dir, dir, is equal to pathlib dot uh, path with uh, uppercase uh, p, and we will pass data uh, dir. Am I right? Yes, I'm right. So this is the, the first part part to get our data, right? Our our pictures. Then I will I will give you an example to train with your own data when this is going to change. I mean if we if we don't have time to complete this, I will give you the Python notebook and it with the instructions. So you can follow this and you can use it with your own images. So let's do this. I will execute this. So you see now that this line here it has a small uh, green arrow is saying that it's performing that operation and it downloaded the, the data and let me do one more thing here I will do print data here so with print print is a line in Python that is useful to uh, print or show in the screen in a specific uh, data or array or number or word so I want to see what is the content of this variable here so I will execute it again and you see that this is the result basically data deer is a is a just a directory that lies inside the root keras dataset flower photos that is the name that we gave to our data set uh, now that we have our data set we can check the data set and check for the amount of images that we have so we will, uh, I will write here, um, step 2.1, check images and uh, the amount of images. How do we do that? I will make another uh, cell here and I will say like image count. We need to get the, the total amount of images that we have. Uh, we will write image count and this will be equal to len l e n this is a, a method in python that if you pass let's say like an array a list of values it will it will give you the number of, of values that you have inside an array or a list or a topic right so in this case we will say len list data dir that glob this is this is a little bit Pythonish type of syntax, but basically what we're doing we're casting. Basically we're forcing um, uh, Python to 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 read the information of all 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 the information in our directory as a list to get the number of images that we that we will use. Right. So in this case we will do uh, something like this. Asterisk does that asterisk that jpeg uh, sorry this is not it's asterisk slash asterisk that j jpg what this is doing is reading all the information in inside the data uh, directory it's looking for all the images with extension jpeg basically and is casting this as a list and then uh, from that list, from all those images, it will give me just one number. So to, to, to see what this is um, doing, I, we can do a print, 
can say something like this, like number of images uh, plus str image uh, count. So let's see. It gave me zero images. That's not correct. So let me see what it, uh, I did wrong. Stated there. Let me check one more thing because we should have more images than that. It's giving me zero images. Why? Let me do this again. Data dear, escape file, origin is the data set URL. Uh, path lead path data dear. Hmm. This should give me at least 3,000 images. So it's giving me zero. It's equal to run list data dear that glob. Do, do, do. This is not correct. Uh, let me probably, if, if you get an error, sometimes it's good to just like restart. If you go to runtime, uh, you can restart the runtime. So that means that you need to run uh, to run this again. So let me. Okay. Uh, oh yes, you're completely right. Oh, so I summed up. Um, flower photo. Yeah, you're totally right. I always forget about that. Sorry. And uh, image count. Oh, I didn't print. Print. Glob basically is a is a, is a um, it's a library that allows you to basically get all the files in a directory. So uh, Python glob. If you Google this, um, so basically you can get in an easy way all all the all the names for example in a directory so if you're dealing with multiple files uh one simple way to go and to do uh operations to get like let's say all the paths of the of an image of the images in a directory or all the files in a directory you want to use glob right that that's that's the that that's the glob uh line so in this case let me see image count yes we have uh, 3670 images so that is good. So when we have our data set, we want to see, we want to check what uh, the images look like. So if I want to see, for example, like uh, uh, one uh, image, for example, to see how the images look like, we can do something like this. So we know that um, I will show you like the categories, but uh, for example, if I want to see roses, roses, we can say um, list. Um, actually, I can copy this line here, but I can replace uh, roses and just leave it like this. So the the glob basically will get all the file names uh from the directory roses we, we will see it in a, in a in a second right uh how does this work and actually it's two parentheses so if i do this and then if i say um i can use pill to 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 show an image i can say like pil image dot um open and here i can just uh do str roses and let me pick image uh, 23 for example right so basically here roses let me print what roses is so you understand roses I'm a little bit dyslexic today roses 
this will print the content of roses and then I will open an image indicating the path. So this is why I'm casting this as a string to open the image. So if I do this invalid syntax, uh, print roses. What did I do? I'm missing a parenthesis. Yeah, I'm missing a parenthesis. So, oh, and actually I don't need the len. Okay, now it will work. So you see what this is doing? This is the result of the print line. This is printing all the all the the paths, all the data paths of all the images that I have. So you see that this is like plus six path, and it's it's giving me like the address of each image. But also, this is showing me the rows number twenty three, basically the twenty third file of this list of this data set. If I change this to, let's say, like 45, I don't want to print the names anymore, uh, 45, and this shows me like a different type of, of data. If I want to see, for example, like tulips, I think uh, tulips probably, yeah. So it has like another type of flowers that are tulips, and it will show me this. But I will change it back to roses because that's the name. So we know that this is working. And what we want to do actually is transform or reformat our data set. So to do that, we will do like uh, transform or reformat our data set. And we will write code here. And we will do a couple of things. We want to uh, process our image data set to format it to the right uh, size for our, for our neural network. But also we want to do the famous split that I mentioned before. From this 3,670 images, we want to leave a certain amount of images for the training process and a certain amount for the validation process, right? So we reserve, we keep some images hidden from our network, so then we can test how accurate it is. And again, we're using data from here, but you can use this this technique to classify whatever you want with your own data, right? And that will be like some sort of like assignment for you to try for tomorrow or for the weekend. That's fine. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is specify some parameters. Specify some parameters. And those parameters are, the first is the batch size. If you have done some machine learning, for example, or if you are kind of familiar with the terms, the batch size is like how many images you want to process at the same time. So basically from this huge uh, amount of images, like more than 3,000, we want to get each time per step, like only 32, for example. That is a batch size. Uh, we want to specify also like uh, the height of the image. Uh, we will say that this is 180, the width of the image, uh, also 180. So we want to feed our neural network with 180 by 180 images. We don't want to go beyond that for because we want to, for demo purposes, we want to train faster uh, than usual. Like, um, and this will be enough. And now we want to create our data set. So this will be step three. Right. Uh, this is step three. Yes, step three. We will create our our sorry our train data set and uh, validation data set. Uh, to do that, we will do something like this. We will call first, and this is like very like uh, standard code. You can find this like almost like in every example. We will do something like. Uh, train underscore ds we will say like tf uh, dot keras that um, preprocessing that image data set from directory this is a method that is already there if you start writing like tf dot keras it will try to autocomplete so basically it's like tf dot keras that preprocessing that image underscore data set underscore from underscore directory 
and we will pass a couple of arguments for this. So basically a couple of, of, of uh, let's say, parameters. So I will open parentheses, and here I will write data dir. Uh, that's the first parameter. Basically, this is the data directory. Then I want to say like the validation split. Uh, validation split is equal to 0 0.2. Basically, it means that we will we will use 80% of our images for training, and we will leave 20% for validation. Uh, we will call this subset. We will use this subset as uh, training. Training. Um, we will use a random seed because this will also shuffle stuff. Uh, 183. It can be like whatever. You can just put it to three or you can specify a name. You will find it both ways. It doesn't matter actually too, too much. This is important. Image size. You want to pass this parameter and you want to indicate what is the size of the of the data that you're that you're inputting, like one one data basically. So here we will pass something that is called a tuple. A tuple is a list, but it's unmutable. Basically, you cannot modify it. And usually, uh, it's very different to basically a tuple is a is a list uh, that you specify with um, round parentheses, like regular parentheses, instead of like lists that are the square uh, brackets, right? Or curly brackets, that is, you can find it in other languages. So in this case, we will pass a tuple indicating the image uh, height. And actually, I want to first, you see that this is showing me that I haven't uh, executed this cell. So I want to execute this. So it's in memory. So now when I write image, uh, it should autocomplete. It's taking a, a little bit, but I want to, sorry, img, um, there it is, img height and img width. So basically those are the both parameters that I'm passing. You can hard code this, like write directly, like 180, 180, but in this case we want to, um, uh, if we want to modify then and use other image size, we can just modify it here instead of just like writing this. Uh, finally, we want to specify the batch size, uh, and this will be equal to batch size. So what we have here is basically like the 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 creation of our. Uh, yeah, it's it's giving me like a like a warning that I'm not using the GPU because I'm using GPU time, whatever. I'm paying them, so they will let me. They need to let me use the GPU. So if I run this, this will create my my data set. It it won't give me any error. So here, for example, is telling me that it found three thousand six hundred and seventy images uh, with five classes. So basically, this data set contains like five types of flowers. One is like I, I will show you uh, later, but basically saying that the 80% of that is to, uh, 2,936 files for training. So we are good with that. Now we want to create our um, validation dataset code, and the, the, the code for that is almost the same, so I can just copy and paste and change just a couple of things. The first things that I, uh, the first thing that I want to change is that we will call this val underscore ds because we want to make this the the validation dataset and in the subset instead of uh, saying that this is training we will write here validation the seed can be the same the image size can be the same and the batch size can be the same so basically now this will create another uh, list with the validation data set. So just copy paste and just change the name and the subset parameter. You just leave this at, at uh, split. So in this case, you see that this already recognizes that this is the validation. So it, sent, it says that it found 
the same amount of files belonging to five classes, but now it's using 734 files for the validation. So from here, we can use those 700 plus files to, to test our, our, our network. And if we want to find or see more information about our data set, uh, to see more info about our about our data sets, we can, for example, um, for example, say something like class names, class underscore names, and we can say train the s uh, that class names. So this is already something that we can have a parameter that is called class names and we can say that it's this equals to train the s train data set dot class names. So this is a method that will give us the the class names. So we can say like print class names uh, names and we should see a list with the, with all the class names. So you see, these are the class names. We we have different folders with daisies, dandelions, roses, sunflowers, and tulips. And this is important because when you use your own images to do like prediction, for example. And again, what we're doing today is not very creative, but we need to do it. Uh, you want to basically, uh, let's say, you want to train a neural network with uh, to detect a specific uh, brands of cars or fruits for example fruits so you want to take like a lot of pictures of apples red apples a lot of pictures of green apples a lot of pictures of bananas a lot of pictures of uh, pineapples and i don't know oranges and you will put all the images of apples in one folder all the images of bananas in one folder and so on and so forth and then, when you fit this, and I will give you the code for that, it's, it's, it's a slight modification of this, uh, automatically TensorFlow would recognize the folder as a class. A class that will be oranges, a class that will be bananas, a class that will be um, whatever. So that's what's happening here, actually. And let's see, uh, let's, let's also visualize the data, right? It's important to see what kind of data do, di did we get after doing this pre-processing. So uh, to visualize the data, we will do the following thing. We will create a plot. This is why we're using matplotlib. So we will say uh, plt, that figure, and we will specify the fig size. And the fixed size in this case is uh, we fit a tuple 16 by 16. What does this mean? This means that we will create a figure, basically a grid of um, 16 by 16 that will contain um, a certain amount of images that I will specify now. So if you have seen Python, uh, you know that Python has a very sp a special way of um, of syntax for loops. So basically we will say the following for images, comma, labels. So basically for each image and labels in train uh, BS that take one. This again, I mean, don't worry much about syntax if you don't understand. This is also like very standard. So basically we will iterate around like all our images and, and, and over all our labels in the train data set. We will say, again, Python has a specific uh, indentation system to, to basically for syntax, meaning that if I'm here basically at the same uh, vertical space than the F, if I want to write something inside this loop, I need to tab once to indent the code, and that will recognize as code that needs to be executed inside the loop. Right? So in this case, I'm doing this, and I will say for i in range, uh, range, basically repeat something uh, a certain amount of times. In this case, I will, 
display 32 images. So I can say like for i in range 32. So basically the i will uh, increase the value at each step by one. It will start with zero. i in the first loop will be zero, then one up to 32. Uh, and again, if I press enter, it's automatically indented. So I will create my plot and this again, super standard code, you can copy paste it from whatever. So we will say like uh, AX is equal to uh, PLT, that subplot, meaning that we will create a grid of A by four and I plus one. So basically this will distribute the 32 images that we want to get from our data set in an A by four grid and it will place each image according to the loop, the position. So basically we'll start with zero plus one, first image, second image, third image. Basically this is the position of the, uh, in the grid. I wanna go a little bit faster with this so we can actually uh, create our, our, our layers. It, won't be, it will be super easy, but this is not the, the important, this is not the meat of what I want to show you today. So I will just write it. This is uh, I am show, I want to show the images, so we'll say like images i um, that numpy uh, as type, uh, well, this is uint 8. So basically we're, we're converting the, the image information as 8-bit um, integer, uh, type of data, and then we'll select PLT, title. Um, we will put the class names, labels, labels, uh, and each label. So each image will have a title according to the label that it has. And we'll select PLT, axis, as off. Again, super standard code for, for Matplotlib. Um, I will execute this and we should see a grid of with image, image samples. So apparently there are no errors. This is executing and yes. So what you see here with that code, I can, because this is super standard, I will copy paste it in the chat in case you didn't follow this. We have, uh, this is an image from roses, dandelions, tulips, uh, sunflowers, and so on and so forth. 32 images. With this, we see that our, our data set is, is working, it's, 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 it's done. Uh, and we want to do one more thing before we create our model. Probably I will stand a couple of more minutes if you can stay. If not, I will try to edit as fast as I can this session today. And uh, send you the the video and the and the and the code. I will publish it also in YouTube in case you're you're interested. So, but we we need a couple of more information. So we need more info about our data set. So we can do simple stuff such as like for um, image batch. Uh, labels batch in train ds. So basically we want to get two things. We can say print uh, image uh, batch that shape. This is very important to know. Um, and we want to say like print uh, label batch that shape and here break. So what what is this? So if I execute this, oh, uh, label batch, sorry. I have a typo here, yeah. What you see here is the shape of the tensor that we're inputting in our image. And this is important because you, you must be wondering like, what the hell is a tensor, right? We know if we're accustomed with like, for example, like um, AutoCAD, Rhino or whatever, that a vector, for example, is a list of three numbers, X, Y, and Z, right? In this case, we're dealing with a tensor. That is something 
uh, kind of different. And I will uh, explain what a tensor is. If I can copy this. Uh, but what the hell is a tensor? And why it's called TensorFlow, for example, right? And a tensor, I think, yeah, this is this is an image that I'm test pasting. So this is a something that corresponds to an image. This is a tensor. So you see here the difference. A scalar value, scalar value, is just, for example, a one or two or whatever. A vector is a list with, for example, like this is a two-dimensional vector with just two values. A three-dimensional has three values. We have something that is called a matrix, just like an image, right? But the tensor basically is like, we can say that it's a, it's a group of values, a group of images. So in this case, this is indicating that our batch, image batch, the shape of our batches are 32 images, because that's the batch size, with uh, data of 180 of 180 pixels and three channels, right? This tells us that these are RGB images. This is why the shape is like 32 images of 100, like one, 180 by 180 pixels and three channels. RGB, right? And also, it's saying that for the the batch si the shape of the labels batch is a group of thirty two just labels. This is why it's showing just that, right? So this is something that we need to understand because usually most of the errors for 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 the ones I I had I I, I had this struggle all the time to understand how to input or how to format the data correctly for, for my machine learning models is because I need to understand what is the shape of the tensor that I will feed into our uh, model. Now, uh, we can do a couple of things. I will just, from my notes, I will just copy paste uh, uh, a chunk of code that I will post also in the chat. So we will, do something that is called auto tune uh, that is necessary for TensorFlow. Um, we will oh, now we will auto tune our data set. Why? Because basically, if we if we paste this code, uh, we will basically use uh, something that is called, if it's for performance, right? We will use something that is called prefetch, that is a feature of TensorFlow to manage efficiently input versus output of our network. We have 3,000 images. It's not a lot, but and we will feed our neural network with batches of 32 images each time. So basically it will be reading, like input, like it will take images as input, feeding that into our neural network and outputting something and then inputting again. So what you want to do is like to, to use this auto-tune so you don't have those uh, input-output errors, for example. Basically, that's, that's, that's what we're doing with this. So this is like code that, actually, this is something that you can copy-paste from like almost like every model. Uh, so we will do that. This will also shuffle the data. And this is showing us like the, the, the some information. It's not it's not very important, but it's necessary. And there is one more thing that we need to do. Uh, we need to normalize our data, and there are two ways we can pre-normalize the data, and I will explain that in a minute uh, by using like a snippet of code that basically will take the images and it will process them in a way that it will normalize our values. That is very important for machine learning. But we can do that step inside our architecture. So we will do that. We will go immediately uh, to the part where we create our, our model. So this will be step four. And we are close to like actually doing what we want to do, uh, predict and train, and we will 
call it the day. I know that is late for some of you, but this is necessary because after this, we will use like similar techniques for the following days. So the step three is actually uh, create our model or architecture, our architecture, and um, normalize the data. What is normalizing data? The values, basically because these are images of a certain amount of uh, pixels width and height, but we have three channels and the values of those channels, uh, the value is expressed of, of each pixel is expressed in between zero and 255, right? Uh, but, but what we want to do always of mo or most of the times with machine learning is to normalize those values. Basically, it, that, that means we want to express those values between a certain range, remap those values between zero or in one or between minus one and one. And that when we will do that step while we're creating our architecture. So we will start creating our, our uh, architecture. We will say that num classes is five because we have five classes. Uh, I think we had somewhere here. We can just like say like class len uh, parentheses class names, but in this case, we're just hard coding because we know we have five classes, that's okay. And here we will create our, our model. Actually, let's call it model. Sometimes you can get confused. So let's create our model. Our model will be called very creative. No, very uncreative. It's called model. And we will say model equals to sequential. Why sequential? Because we're creating a, a model that basically has sequential layers, one after the other, stacked. And this is why this is a functionality of Keras to create in an easy way, these models. And here is where it comes like the, the, the meat of what we're doing. Here we are coding our uh, layers. And we will start with the first one that is called layers dot uh, experimental dot preprocessing dot rescaling. And here we will pass one point divided by 255, we will specify the input shape, and I will explain in a, in a minute what this is, and here we will pass a, a tuple that will be uh, I am uh, height, comma, I am G width, comma, three, and comma. So this layer, what it's doing is rescaling, is remapping the values between, uh, basically is, is remapping the values from zero to 255 to something that is more suitable for our, our network. And of course, we need to uh, specify the input shape of our images that are 180 by 180 by three. First thing that we need to do in our model. Now we will start creating our, our uh, convolution uh, layers. So we will say that layers that conv to D layers, sorry, not layer, layers, layers that conv, conv to D. So if I, if I write CON, I see that a lot of um, options, like uh, we have LSTMs or 3D convolutions, in this case, we're using 2D, so we said com 2D, and here we need to specify the parameters. First is the parameters. How many filters do we want to use? So basically, how many chunks of the image that are randomly assigned do we want to use? Remember that we, we will move from one image to filter, to a stack of filter images, right? In the example that I gave you in the presentation, we used three filters, and that created three new images. In this case, we will start with 16. Then we need to specify the kernel size to actually create those new values. So we will create a kernel size, basically the size of the portion of the image that we want to walk through our image to get new values. It will be of size three. Padding, this is basically like when we reach the end of the, uh, 
are we using this try let wait let me see one thing of the parameters because uh it's 16 then we are using okay so we will use 16 filters then the kernel size is three the strides we will leave it by default we want uh specify a specific stride basically how many spaces are we moving uh the, by default this is one one so basically we'll move after it does the, the first calculation with the window size 3x3, three three, it will move one pixel to the right and one pixel down after it reaches the end. Uh, the padding is basically like the um, if you want to consider, for example, if you reach the end of the of the image, if you want to consider basically like the, the just like the remaining pixels or do you want to get like apply some sort of like boundary condition where you can also like consider the pixels on the on the beginning of the, the, the initial column, let's say. In this game, we will say like uh, the kernel size of three, we will specify the padding as same. Uh, and for the activation, this is important, activation, we will use, actually let me just use the simple uh, same. For the activation, we will use the famous reloop. Uh, right? And this is our first convolution layer. This will create 16 images. Right? Now, just as I explained in the presentation, we need to create another layer. So if you press, if you write comma and then enter, you will go to the next line. And we will create a max pooling layer. So we'll say like layers that max uh, layers that max pool uh, is a max pool 2D. We're doing the operation that basically picks the maximum values. And from here, we can just copy paste because we saw in the architecture in the presentation that this convolution and this max pooling will repeat. We just need to change the parameters. So I can just press comma, enter, and paste, copy paste the two lines, and I just need to change the parameter. So here, for example, instead of using uh, 16 filters, I will use 32. So basically I will create from 16 images I will double the amount of images and basically I will have from one image I will get 16 smaller images and then I will get 32 smaller images. I will go through the same uh, max pooling process and again I can just copy and paste the same thing and change this to 64. So I will increase the amount of images while decreasing the size of the image. And when we reach this, this is a very very basic convolution layer. So we will see that it won't perform as well, but it will train fast. So I'm taking more time. I will, I will finish this and I will send you more so we can uh, continue tomorrow. So don't worry um, because we want to finish training and also detecting. So I will show you that before we finish. So here, um, after the last max pooling, I want to create a layers that flatten. Uh, Sorry, it's with uh, uppercase F, flatten. And basically this matrix, like each image will be flattened into just one list, just like Grasshopper is doing it. Then we will create a layers that dense. So what is this doing? Basically this is formatting like the, the flattened layer. It will be uh, basically dense it will be connected in a very dense way. So basically you will connect each pixel, each unit or each neuron of that layer to the uh, to the next one. And we will do this because we want to um, basically reduce the or transform that flattened uh, layer into an, like a an specific amount of um, values. Because basically what we want to do we want to finish with fi only five values, a list of five values, right? So in this case, we will say like layers that dance 128. We will reduce the values to 128. 
we will perform as activation uh, relu again because we will get rid of negative values or we remember that why do we want to use relu in this case we, we are getting rid of negative values uh, because th they don't contribute to anything in our in our model and finally we will select layers that dense uh, and here we will use uh, num classes so basically this will reduce uh, a list of or basically a layer of 128 neurons to only five right so to explain this uh, quickly uh, just let me uh, execute this so actually I'm missing yeah I'm missing one thing to create your layers you need to create this as a list so you open parentheses and then you open square bracket and then you close the square bracket as well so hopefully this gave me an error what is the error ah this is same typo same no Dame same okay now it worked actually what we can say here is just print model so you see that this created an object in memory that is a tensorflow that python that keras engine sequential sequential object app it, our model was created so one thing that i need to show you because this is important let me just close a couple of things um, Let me show you the explanation. Let me reshare my screen. I will take probably like 15 more minutes if that's okay with you. If no, you can you can leave. If you need to leave, I will I will continue this uh, recording. But let me just uh, share one thing. So, what we're doing is uh, starting with. Oh, one second. I need to draw this. Just one small second. Full area. Is this drawing here? Mm. Okay, now it will draw. Sorry, I'm drawing in my screen. So basically, we have our image with units, right? These are these are our our pixels. So to understand what is going on, if we have an image here, we're filtering, we're creating smaller versions up to 16, right? Uh, then we're applying more filters, so we're creating like smaller versions up to 64, right? We have one in the middle that is creating 32, but that's fine actually. Let me just write it. It's always good to have, uh, even though this is a very crappy explanation, uh, 32, and then we'll have like smaller images up to 64. And if I zoom, right, this is a, a small image that I'm assuming, let, let's say that the, the final filters are images of um, let's say like three by three matrix um, and this has like different values like one if we go back to our previous example like one zero one zero one zero this is random what we're doing with the with the flattening right instead of representing these values as a matrix we will represent this as a um, as a list, let's say like it will be one zero one uh, one zero one one zero one and zero one zero. So basically, this is a list. And what in 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 the network is happening is that we will have a huge, 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 huge list, right? Of parameters so basically we will get in one list one big list all the pixels and then 
through applying uh, the, the, the ReLU function, let me zoom out a little bit, um, we will transform, like, let's say these are, I'm just like saying, we have, let's say, like 90,000 pixels, right? We will create a new layer uh, that is fully connected. So basically, we will say, like, now you will reduce the amount of pixels from 90,000 to only 128. And you will do that by connecting each pixel to the following, like to each neuron. In the previous layer, each pixel or each neuron, you will connect it to the following layer. And you will do that. So basically, you will have like a lot of connections to reduce that number to 128. Oh, this is a terrible drawing, but I hope you understand. And then if I move back, basically, you will have uh, units up to 128 that we are doing here do, 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 do. then you will say okay apply another fully connected layer only with five possible outputs and you will do that by performing the same operation that you will connect the first lay the first neuron here the first neuron to the all the outputs the second you will do the same you will connect this with all of them. So in the end, by applying in this case uh, ReLU, you will end up only with five values. That that is your output, and those five values correspond to the classes that you want to predict. So if you remember when we did, uh, when I explained you the the convolutional uh, the convolutions, right? Uh, with the for example with the MNIST data set, you will end up in that case with ten values, and you will pick the higher as the prediction. So let me reshare my screen for the code. Uh, yeah, this is my screen. And we have the model. And just let me do something because I'm also recording our stuff. So this is my model. Just give me one small second. So um, what we want to do now is compile the model. So we have the object, but now we need to compile it in order to use it. So we will compile the model. And to compile the model, we will do the following. We'll say like model.compile. And we will, uh, here we will, uh, indicate what is the optimizer. So as I was saying, there are different optimizers, uh, stochastic, uh, gradient descent, stochastic, stochastic gradient descent, we will use Adam. You can find more information or I will send you like different types of optimizers. We'll use something that is called Adam. Doesn't matter right now to be super specific. Uh, we need to indicate also how are we calculating the loss, basically like the error. So in this case, we will use um, uh, a sparse categorical cross entropy. That is a way to calculate like the the the, the, the error. Uh, I show you in the in the toy example that you can use like mean square error. For example, this is another way of doing it. So we will write like tf keras uh, that loses the sparse uh, categorical cross entropy, and it has an option. Uh, that I never, I don't remember what it is, but when you say like from logits, you need to put it to, th to, to true. We will do that. I don't remember why. Don't judge me. And finally, we will say like the metrics that we want to get in this case are the accuracy. That's something that we want to measure now. Accuracy. How accurate our model is. And there is a particular reason for that, but probably I will talk to you when we move to something more complex. But this is important because now, for example, if I, this will compile the model, and then we can say like model that summary. And this will show you the architecture that we are creating. So if I press this, uh, I have a Q, oh, 
typo, accuracy. And metrics, oh, and this is metrics equal. Always typos, and what else? Oh, more typos. And what am I missing here? Da, 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 da. Loss equals from logits uh, true. Let me check my notes and metrics. Oh, and now I put equals here. Okay, now should. Okay, so after you write this, you will see a summary of your model. Also, this is usual that you see in presentations and stuff, but it's telling you that this is a sequential model, one after the other, one layer after the other. You are rescaling your images. Uh, you are creating like a convolutional uh, convolution layer with 448 parameters. Uh, so you pass from, basically you transform this like each time. And this is telling you that we are training 3 million, almost 4 million parameters in our network, right? But what we want to do is we want to train our model. This is the, the, the next step. This is a step uh, five, probably. It's four, three, four, step four. And I'm, we're almost there, step four. Um, train our model, sorry, step four. And this will probably train fast, but not very accurately. But I want you to go through this idea so we will specify the epochs the or epochs the epochs are basically the 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 you will we will do uh, steps basically iterations and let's say we have like 3000 steps we will repeat those 3000 steps uh many times as epochs as we have so for example in this case like basically one epoch is the uh, is the number of of times that it takes your data to, to go over all your data. So basically to, to, so your model goes through all your data. That it is, I'm, I'm tired now. I had an early morning. I started at five. So I will say like here, history is equal to model that fit and this is this is the command that you will or what you will uh, write to train your model. So we we'll say like train ds. That's the first parameter. First first parameter. Then we will say like the validation data. Uh, but, oh, sorry, val ds. Uh, no, it's validation data equals to val uh, ds and epochs is equal to uh, epochs. So you see you have more parameters, you can have like many other stuff, but in this case, we just want to specify these three parameters. Fit is basically like try to, it's basically to train our model. So if I do this, you will see that our, our neural network will start training. And again, there's nothing creative about our first uh, session today, but it's necessary to understand what neural networks are, what convolution uh, convolutions are, and to go through the process of managing data, specifying layers, specifying our model, compiling our model, that is something that we just did, and going through the training. So in the training you will see that this is going like through like different steps and it's showing us like what is the epoch and what is the loss. So basically what is like the error that we have and how accurate is our model, right? So it's showing us like the, the, those parameters. So we can see that our model, for example, like the loss didn't decrease much. I mean, uh, uh, and the accuracy is also not, this is the, 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 the numbers are not, are not very, very, very good. I will just copy paste a chunk of code in the chat so I can show you a couple of things because you want to see this graphically. If we copy paste this code that I just gave you, uh, this will 
plot, again, this is like super standard code, this will plot the performance of our, our code. So we're dealing with a problem here. So we're training, uh, here we're showing the training and the validation accuracy and the training and validation loss, two things. So we can, as we can see here, we're dealing with a problem with our training loss and accuracy are quite different from our validation loss and accuracy, right? The validation accuracy is basically like the ground truth. This is showing that how it should perform. Uh, and this is showing us how it is performance actually, right? So when we see a mismatch between training and validation loss, for example, we see that the validation is doing like very different to our, our training loss. That is a sign of our overfitting. Uh, does any of you know what overfitting is? Have you heard about this con that concept? So basically it's like, because we're optimizing and we, when we optimize, uh, for example, like gradient descent, I don't know if you remember the, the, I don't know if I can write here. Yeah, I can write here. So I'm gonna draw, let me do something. When we, uh, I'm gonna draw here. When we are doing like gradient descent, so imagine that we have a, a value of data like this, right? When you are trying to, to optimize, for example, with a gradient descent, what you want to reach is like the lowest point of, of this uh, landscape, right? But what you see here, for example, is that you have also like other valleys. So when you're optimizing, you will reach to a point, for example, where you will believe that this is the, 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 the lowest value or the lowest point of our landscape, right? So basically this is a local minima. This is called a local minima. And this is like the true minima, right? So in this case, what is going on? Because we have, we don't have a lot of, uh, let me just clear this. How do we, how do I clear? Uh, okay, I erase here. So um, basically because we are, we are working with not much data, right? Uh, the, the, the network gets pretty comfortable at, uh, at a certain, basically like predicting values in a certain way, right? Basically it gets like super com comfortable. Oops, I was freezing for a moment. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, I'm back. Sorry, my computer crashed. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, let me share my screen again. I, I, I don't know why my computer crashed, but that's fine. So I will continue explaining this. Um, screen two. Okay, so basically what happens is that because you have like you don't have much data, so the computer gets like very comfortable at just predicting one type of image each, each time in this case. So basically it gets like super comfortable. It, it says like, I don't know, it, it could get to a point where like every flower, it detects that it, it, it believes that it is a rose. So even though if you're like showing like a lily, for example, or a tulip, basically you can say like, no, this is a rose, this is a rose because it got like, too comfortable with that because you don't have much data. And that was one of the problems with artificial intelligence and computer science during the 70s and the 80s that there was no way to get a lot of data because we didn't have internet. And that was like the major like break, like thing that changed everything. Now with the internet, you have companies that can basically get data from you, from your behavior or generate like a lot of data. 
so you can train more accurate models and overcome this this was like the typical problem the overfitting it's just like always fitting the classification in, in one basically saying that one thing is like the ground truth and we can basically overcome this with a couple of techniques one of uh, uh, I mean we, we cannot get more data than this but we can do something that is called data augmentation and I will ex extend this for five more minutes sorry that I'm extending um, but this is necessary to finish it today uh, data augmentation is basically a process where you can generate more data from the data that you already have meaning that if you have a picture you can apply different operations like rotation translation scaling mirroring etc to create more data so you can basically uh, train with more uh, with more images so I will just copy paste the code to do this and I will oops not that let me copy uh, okay and I will copy this in the chat as well uh, so you can have it so basically what this is doing this is using a it's creating like data augmentation it's using uh, operations like in this case like random rotations random zoom uh, and things like that so I will uh, do this data augmentation and we can actually um, visualize this and again I will for the sake of time I will just copy paste this code and copy paste it oh I'm sorry I've been copy pasting code to uh, let me copy yeah so okay this is the code that um, probably you had this let me do copy the okay this is the data augmentation code and finally I will paste the the plotting so I want you to see now that uh, I will generate or this is the result of doing the data augmentation from one image I'm just performing like different rotations different uh, translations and so on and so forth basically I'm, I mean the images look like pretty pretty similar so let me do it again yeah it's doing probably like a crappy job at that because it's showing me like pretty similar just like believe me this have like subtle changes anyway we don't care about that but also we want to add something that is called dropout and at a given rate so what is dropout basically would you don't want all this all the neurons firing basically activating during your training so what you want to do is that randomly at each stage of the training you want to deactivate some neurons so basically you add like some sort of like noise or chaos in your in your network so you don't get basically you don't get um, comfortable by doing the same operation each time so we do that by adding dropout so I will copy paste again I will I will give you that the full call out um, we add dropout to fire different neurons at each step so some neurons I will just deactivate and I will do this with this code it's the same architecture but you can see that here at this point in my architecture in the line 12 I am adding a dropout so it's saying that deactivate randomly 20 percent of the neurons so they don't contribute to the calculation so this is the code it's exactly the same code but just drop out I will do that I will copy and paste the compilation of my model and I will uh, also print the summary 
And with this, I will finish. I promise. Sorry for extending, but this is important. So I have the new architecture. And now, if I run the training again, but I will add five epochs. So that now, if I uh, compile this and train, we will see that things will look different. Like the the validation, you see that the accuracy of the of the validation versus the accuracy of the training are pretty similar. So basically, it tells me that the model is not overfitting. It's not getting like too comfortable at just like predicting what type of one type of values and we will see that when we plot again our 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 training so now it, it finished so if we plot this I'm copy and pasting this is the same code as before but you can see that now the red uh, sorry the orange line is pretty similar to the to the blue line so we can see that our model perform better it didn't it didn't get this um, this behavior here that is a sign of overfitting and how do we uh, how do we do basically what what is this useful so let me just do one more thing uh, we can test uh, the model on new data so I will just copy paste this uh, code snippet here also for you so this will take one image from the internet like whatever in this case it's a sunflower it will create a path and then it will process this image it will load the image then it will convert this image info into an array numpy array and then it will predict it will instead of doing model that fit we will use something that is called model that predict and the data that we will input basically we can put it here is the image array and then we will say that um, give me the score using something that is called submax that I will explain later because it's more complicated and after that we will just print basically what is the um, the result of this so if we fit this image here this image it should predict uh, that this is a sunflower so let's do this and it gave me an error why 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 in user code I did something wrong like this no what is the error that it is giving me Input zero of layer sequential trees and color and layer expected. Uh, 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 uh. Hide and width. Ah, oh, this is weird. Anyway, the the prediction part I don't want to extend more. Also, I have a, a another meeting in thirty minutes, but I will send you the full. I have a, a another meeting in thirty minutes, but. I will send you the full uh, code for this and also like uh, very quickly tomorrow I will give you the code so you can train on your own data how to prepare uh, how to prepare basically your own data to train your own images to do classification but tomorrow we will move into something more complex that are generative adversarial networks so you will understand how to prepare your data, how to prepare the meat of the AI, uh, how they call it for that workshop, uh, but also like how to, yeah, how to basically tailor your own data set to train stuff and to detect with your own data. Because if you're working with other people's data, there is no point in using machine learning. And that is a problem that I see a lot. So sorry for the extension. I will send you the recording and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope this was useful. See you tomorrow, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.